uh, this grand initiative uh, connecting up all sorts of people who work with the Shakespeare Institute, via the Shakespeare Institute, by being put in touch by the Shakespeare Institute and being put in touch with each other across fields in which Shakespeare works in people's lives, in people's societies. Uh, things Shakespeare does beyond uh, examination rooms, seminars and university exams uh, in the Anglophone world. Uh, so yesterday we had sessions on uh, Shakespeare in translation, Shakespeare uh, around the world, Shakespeare in the world of diplomacy, uh, the extent to which Shakespeare uh, is contaminated or empowered by association with national identity, um, both in the UK uh, and elsewhere. Uh, there was a memorial session for Yezh Limon. Um, you'll be able to watch all of this uh, since it's all being recorded and it will be up uh, on the website uh, in due course. Um, this afternoon we have coming up um, Bridging Divides is the next session, uh, Applied Shakespeare in prisons uh, with Blue Apple Theatre, with the Prisoners Education Trust uh, and with Sue Jennings, who's an honorary fellow of the Institute uh, and the person who more or less invented drama therapy. Later, uh, a session on amateur theatre, uh, something we're prepared to admit exists, uh, though many scholars don't. Uh, and um, there'll be a whole session on how Shakespeare can uh, further the cause of equality uh, with some terribly distinguished people. Well, I mean, they all have. Um, and a round table, uh, including Butterfly Theatre, uh, and uh, the, the uh, Shakespeare and Yosemite um, eco-symboline team um, who are not to be missed. Uh, but for the moment, um, I'm going to hand over uh, to Chris and Rowan. Uh, because of our international engagement, I'm afraid I'm due in a committee meeting in uh, Singapore uh, with some of the people you met yesterday. Uh, but um, I, I will be back. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, the rest of the afternoon's uh, show. Meanwhile, over to Chris and Rowan. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and I see you kind of putting into practice the Beyond Borders theme and crossing over to Singapore. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I just thought I'd go over a couple of my highlights from yesterday, because this has been such a fantastic event so far. I've just been blown away by you know, this group of people from so many different backgrounds, nationalities, professions, and walks of life coming together to share their passion for Shakespeare and really celebrate that. And so many wonderful ideas were generated um, for the Alliance moving forward. I'm, I'm, I, for one, I'm going to be going over all the recordings again, um, just to see all those great suggestions again and sort of take stock of them and distill them, because I kind of want to put them in a glass vial and create an everlasting elixir out of them. Um, it's so fabulous listening to all those amazing ideas. And one highlight for me actually was um, the soft power panel. I found that really, really engaging, particularly this. I think what partly what we're all doing here collectively across all these panels is feeling not just thinking our way through, but feeling our way through a new lexicon for talking about Shakespeare and engaging with Shakespeare, a kind of language that belongs to all of us because we're making it together. It isn't it isn't a set of descriptors that have been handed down on high. You know, we're, we're, we're questioning um, the kinds of language that have developed around Shakespeare, which have been generated by certain sectors of society. And we're, we're generating that language, a new language in effect together. And I find that an incredibly empowering and exciting thing. And for me, it's kind of shaking up Shakespeare um, in the way that we engage with, with Shakespeare as an entity, as a concept, um, the impact of his work through the language you use to describe him. Uh, one other um, highlight for me, I mean, all the panels have been so incredible. You know, Rowan's Prisons panel was just inspiring. It's so wonderful hearing all of those stories. Um, uh, Michael's first panel on international Shakespeare's was amazing because it brought so many people from around the globe together. And just from my own personal point of view, I did find actually the Cyprus panel really enlightening. You know, I'm a, I'm a UK born Cypriot and I learned so much about Cyprus. I didn't know about the incredible work that's going on there. Um, 
to cross a border which has been there since 1974 with both sides of that border working together and doing incredible work um, uh, to, to bring communities together across that divide. And I think that's a wonderful model for the world. So those are my highlights. Um, and I'll hand over now uh, to Rowan so that she can tell us hers. Thank you very much, Rowan. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, I could spend uh, an inordinate amount of time talking about things that I took from yesterday. I think for me, it was just overwhelming and humbling, the number of people and the diversity of people that have, have registered for this event. Um, academics, practitioners, participants in programs, alumni from, from various programs, um, but also people that have just genuinely got a love of Shakespeare and an interesting community, um, and people that have contacted me and said, actually, could I attend? I'm not an academic, I don't know, but I'd like to come along. The answer is yes, and we want those voices because we need to get away from, and I'm very passionate about um, moving away from this idea that Shakespeare needs to be set on a pedestal and you know we have to be good enough to attain it. Shakespeare wrote his plays for people to go and watch. He didn't write his plays for academics to spend years dissecting it when, you know, to the, to the nth degree of minutiae. Um, and it's great that, that people do engage with Shakespeare and, and look at the text and we all know the richness that it offers. But I think for me, it's about moving beyond that idea of Shakespeare as some kind of panacea. Um, and I think Paul Edmondson in the, the Soft Power Roundtable yesterday um, raised some really valid points around, you know, we need to challenge and interrogate those ideas of cultural capital. It's a double-edged sword. Um, we need to think about what we mean by soft power, what, what actually Shakespeare does, and to avoid um, the term that Todd Landon Barnes talks about in terms of, you know, kind of hell's redemptive theater um, and Shakespearean charity and, and this whole kind of white savior trope. So for me, it's it's been an amazing event to see this actually come to life. And I know Chris and I have been speaking about Cessna with Beyond Borders Alliance for a number of years to actually have 600 people engaging in, in various conversations, you know, from as far flung places as uh, Russia, Brazil, China, Japan, and Cyprus, Greece, the US, um, Australia. I know we had delegates attending from yesterday. Um, it's a real honor. And actually I feel very proud that we're part of enabling this conversation to happen. And I think it's really, it's really, really pertinent and really relevant. Um, and, and inadvertently COVID's probably helped in that because it's given us the, the push that we needed to make this accessible to all. Um, and to make this accessible across all sorts of geographic boundaries that otherwise would have prohibited people from being here. So a huge thank you to everybody that was involved in yesterday. Um, I know I came away feeling, um, you know, just overwhelmed with it. Um, and I know, you know, the amount of, of media coverage we've had from Twitter, I know lots of people have been sharing in their own newsletters, et cetera. Let's keep that buzz going and let's, let's keep those conversations happening because it really is about creating communities that are inclusive um, and genuinely inclusive, not just that pay lip yeah. service to it. Absolutely. Um, and also shout out to Matt for all the hard work he's done behind the scenes uh, for making this work technically, because it, it has been a huge feat on a technical level. So huge thanks to Matt Lee for his tremendous hard work and, and to you, Rowan, for your publicising on Twitter. I know you've done a lot of work there and for everybody who's been tweeting it and talking about it. And that that's really kind of been amazing and just before we begin the next panel I did want to uh, mention that um, at the end of the event the complete event we will be circulating a questionnaire and we'll be so grateful to all of you if you could complete that questionnaire because it's really important for what's going to happen next um, we want to create this alliance with all of you um, so we're doing this together so we want to hear from you you know what do you want from this alliance and how can it help you? And so we'll be taking stock of all of that and taking it very seriously and it will shape in a very decisive way what we do from here on in. So when you get that, the call for, for that questionnaire, which will happen when the three days of the event is finished, do please complete, um, to complete that, we'd be really grateful. Uh, thank you very much indeed.
Right, I think this is my cue to disappear so that you can carry on with your, your fascinating way. Welcome to stay on the panel if you like, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'll be less productive um, in advising about an applied theatre setting. So despite despite having supervised your PhD, from, from which I learnt more from you than you did from me. Um, so um, I'll be continuing that process of education by watching your fabulous panel. So thank you very much. It would be a nice to see you all later. All right, thanks, Chris. And I'm hoping that our wonderful panelists are, are now able to, to turn their cameras back on and to join us. Um, as if by magic. Wonderful. Um, and then Laurie, are you able to turn your camera back on my dear? <coughs> Hopefully Laurie's there. So button that says start video, stop video. There oh, it wonderful. is. Fantastic. With a, yes. with a very appropriate t-shirt on, I think. <laughs> Can you show us the t-shirt, Laurie? Yep, it's, it's a quote from Ozzy from Macbeth. It's this, it died yet, I see before mm. me. Yeah, something yeah, wicked this way comes. Yes. Love it. Love it. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Um, this session is about bridging divides and creating communities through Applied Shakespeare. Um, so I'm really honoured today to be joined by Richard and Laurie from Blue Apple Theatre, uh, by Francesca from the Prisons Education Trust, by Dr Sue Jennings, who has a list of, of affiliations that would take all panel to do, so I'm going to skip over them, let her introduce herself and by Ralph Lukowski, who is a prison governor, but actually joins us live today from Edgbaston, where we've dragged him away from the test match. Sorry about that, Ralph. So I'm literally gonna hand over and ask you each to do a, a sort of 30, 40 second introduction to yourself, because it all seems to make far more sense than me introducing you. So Richard, do you want to, uh, do you want to start? Uh, happy to start. Yeah, my name's uh, Richard Conlon. As you can see, I, I've been, um, a playwright and a theatre director for oh, crikey since youth theatre days um, in the late 80s that sounds absurd now um, but I've been working with Blue Apple Theatre for the past five years um, creating shows for adults with a learning disability so that would be people um, with for instance downs or uh, on the autism spectrum or other um, learning disabilities um, and trying to trying to tread that very careful balance. We don't always do Shakespeare. That's important to say. Um, tread that balance between being entertainers and, frankly, just trying to make the world a better and more equitable place, uh, one show at a time. So that's me. Cheers, Richard. Laurie, let's hear from you. Well, for one, because my name is Laurie Morris, is for one. And I'm a, I have always been a Shakespearean person myself, really, because I as I grew up watching Shakespeare. Because the very first Shakespeare play I saw was the version of Kenneth Branagh doing Henry V, because that's what started on, on my love of Shakespeare. And because the language as well, and the non speeches, I just love them all. And I know that Richard say that we do have a place that it's not Shakespeare, but to me, I always will prefer Shakespeare because it's just me. Yep. Absolutely, Laurie. I'm with you on that one. I think we should vote for more Blue Apple Shakespeare's exactly. myself. But... <laughs> Uh, Francesca, would you like to, to introduce yourself? Thank you, Rowan, and I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, for those of you that don't know, Prisoners Education Trust, what we do is we support people in prison by funding distance learning courses. So there isn't always the variety of the choice of courses in prison, there isn't always courses provided by education departments at all levels. So we are really trying to plug that gap by trying to support people who can do distance learning. 
and that includes a wide, wide range of courses. We say that we do courses from beekeeping to bookkeeping, uh, but more relevantly for today, we do courses in creative writing, and we know how valuable the people that do those courses find them. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, Sue? Yes, hello. Um, people tend to label me as creating or inventing or pioneering drama therapy, which to a certain extent is true. However, I do wish originally the word theatre rather than drama was used to give it a much wider remit, because a lot of therapists stop short of performance whereas I think performance is the culmination of the therapeutic process or the education process, however we're viewing it. And I've done a lot of work over the years in enclosed institutions and maximum security hospitals. And um, maybe a little later on, I'll talk about my Romeo and Juliet project in Rikers Prison in New York. I'm very keen at the moment on trying to stimulate and promote the theme of love. So it's Shakespeare does it all. And in, in, in the sort of social skills type of atmosphere, we, we tend to leave that out. And I want to re-engage all my students and participants on the theme of love. Brilliant, thanks Sue. And Ralph. Hello everyone, apologies if there's a big cheer in the background, I can't do a lot about that really. Um, so yeah, my name's Ralph Lepkowski, I'm the Governor of HMP Huel at the moment. I started working with uh, Rowan at HMP Stafford. Um, I've got a real passion for the creative arts in custody and Rowan, uh, meeting Rowan was just a fantastic opportunity to bring Shakespeare into HMP Stafford after the brilliant work she'd done at Gar Street. Um, I'm also a member of the steering panel for the um, National Criminal Justice Arts Alliance. Um, so, yeah, this is an area of real passion for me. So hence dialing in from the from the cricket. So looking forward to hearing what everybody's got to say. Brilliant. Thanks, Ralph. And I think without a doubt, that will be the best place that we've had a, a dial in from for the whole conference. I'm sure that we can we can go on that basis. <laughs> Um, so I'm really conscious of time because these are really short panels. What I would say is that we're seeing this as the first of many conversations. So, I, you know, we will obviously be naturally restricted in what we can do. But the intention is that I'm going to ask each of you a question and then hopefully we'll have some time for a bit more general chat at the end. Um, but I think, you know, that will give everybody a chance to speak a little bit about some of the, the areas that, that they particularly engaged with. Um, so I'm going to come to you first, Richard, if that's all right and a topic that I know you and I have discussed many times, but I'm sure the people on this would, would appreciate um, understanding a little more. So obviously Blue Apple, I know, don't do exclusively Shakespeare, but you've worked with Shakespeare a number of times, including Hamlet uh, back in 2012, The Tempest in 2019, which just is a little bit of a plug for everybody. You can watch the full version of The Tempest tonight uh, from Blue Apple featuring Laurie and some other brilliant cast members. And that will, that will be live at six o'clock BST. So you can click on the link and watch the whole production. It was stunning. Um, but, and obviously I know you've also now got plans for uh, the Scottish play for next year. So I just wonder what is it about Shakespeare that you think makes it so suitable for Blue Apple? And how do you go about editing that to fit with, with the company? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so very much, uh, you know, you were you were saying in the introduction, uh, a lot of people are coming to this uh, these sessions not as academics, uh, and I'm definitely not one of those. Uh, we are just storytellers. We are people who are trying to share stories and work out, you know, that kind of commonality of the the people on the stage with the people in the audience and make sure that you know, the, the tales that we all understand are, are being told again and again, and, and to, to help, I guess, find, uh, that, that's the great thing about Shakespeare, I guess, is the endless reinvention. Um, and what one of the things that's, that's important to me is to make sure that the audience get to understand that these, these tales belong to everybody, that they are not the preserve of any elite, whether that's a white or a European elite, um, and 
you know, the, the themes are so universal of love. Thank you, Sue, um, of, you know, revenge, of ambition um, that they they ring true again and again and again. And it's, it's important for me. I, I have a little kind of comedy byline for Blue Apple, which says it's the most civil of civil rights organisations and the most social of social justice movements, you know, because what we are doing is making a political point every time um, somebody with a learning disability stands on stage and says, listen to me tell you a story, because you may not have seen anybody like me tell you a story before. And we, forgive me if I'm taking too long, Robert, just tell me to stop. But, you know, I feel like we are in that, I mean, I've been doing this, as I said, since the 80s, uh, and I have seen, um, you know, uh, feminist theatre and theatre of people with colour and disability theatre, um, all kind of have an ascendancy, all be part of that national and international debate about why is nobody listening to us? And I think that the Blue Apple cast, you know, they may, may they may not be the last wave of people to say, take us seriously. Um, but, you know, they're certainly, they're certainly further back in the queue. Um, and we are in a, a national and international conversation about who has the right to tell stories. Um, and who has the right to be listened to um, and it's interesting that you know this is about beyond borders because i think for blue apple as an organization a small organization based in a you know hampshire in england um it feels like this is more about beyond barriers there used to be barriers for adults with learning disabilities my mother was a nurse she worked with adults with a learning disability behind a locked gate I used to visit her when I was 10 years old and chat to the, the people uh, who were kept in what was called a home. Um, and that's ancient history now. So, you know, and I think that that all sorts of policy changes uh, have made that ancient history, but kind of grappling and holding on to the culture and saying we are part of your culture. We're not just part of your, you know, you don't just see us around town. You'll see us on stage. You'll see us being part of civic life that really is important to me and and one of uh, my last point is that we are very robust with Shakespeare we take something like the Tempest and we kick bits out of it and plug bits into it so that we get a cast of 35 people on stage instead of a cast of 10 um, and then we we make sure that they all have something valuable to do and we also try with a bit of wit and charm and humour um, to make sure that what we are saying is has kind of got some some relevance to to now capital N now. So our our take on the the tempest was about what it meant to be British, what it meant to be English at a time when uh, Brexit was uh, a hot topic, um, and uh, you know that that I hope it didn't kind of bump the story of uh, Prospero and Miranda and Caliban off stage. It kind of complemented it, I hope. Um, and uh, as Sue says, you know, themes are important. So our Tempest was part of a theme of reconciliation alongside, what did we do, Christmas Carol that year. And we are going to do the Scottish play next year. We're saying the Scottish play, that's fine. Um, with the theme of ambition, along with Wizard of Oz, you know, because the characters in the Wizard of Oz have an ambition to have a heart, uh, a brain, uh, courage, um, and of course the, the Scottish play has an ambition theme that goes beyond that. Uh, so, you know, that's what we try and do, unpick some big themes in everybody's lives, you know, we, we marry up the mundane and the miraculous in everybody's lives because, frankly, we all grub along every day with a bit of both going on you know um so that's what we aim to do in our little way i'll shut up now absolutely i'm just gonna have to correct you on one thing though richard you're not just storytellers you are storytellers <laughs> and we Thank should you. all be proud yeah. of that storytelling yeah. is actually how we connect with other human beings isn't it and and i think you know i mean i i'm fortunate that i get to come down and be be a small part of the work that blue apple do when you're working on Shakespeare's, um, you know, it's an amazing experience and and it makes people's lives richer for having seen the production. So, you know, don't don't undersell it. Um, Laurie, I'm gonna come on and talk to you now, if that's all right, my dear. Um, and I know you've you've always had a passion for Shakespeare, and I know if it was up to you, 
it would be Shakespeare play after Shakespeare play. Um, but I think you're not allowed to do that. So, um, but I just want, I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit, Laurie, about what it is about Shakespeare that you find so engaging and how you found, obviously you've performed in the Shakespeare productions that Blue Apple have done. So what, what's it been like from your perspective? Well, mostly because the reasons why I just love Shakespeare, mostly because it's the language and because of the very long speeches they have, and because it is too long, because I just always love it. It's within three hours of, say, Hamlet or King Lear or Othello. It's just, it's nice when it's, it gets spent a long time just watching a play. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And and how have you found it being in, in the Shakespeare plays? Because I know you've read all the Shakespeare plays as well, haven't you? And I know yeah. you've watched them. What's it been like actually acting in it? It's actually it been was quite nice because I have played this it's been a dick in much to but nothing. And I said Caliban in, in Tempest and I said so, so Claudius and Lysander. And it's it's actually great fun actually. Performing Shakespeare has all has always been my biggest highlights. Brilliant. And I know, because I know you're doing some work on a, a one-person play, aren't you, as well? That yeah, I think we'll talk a lot yeah. about Shakespeare. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and Francesca, I just wonder if I can come to you and I'll say I know um, you and I have known each other and, and you've actually been and watched one of the productions that, that uh, one of the theatre companies performed. Just wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about in your experience with the Prisons Education Trust, what benefits the arts and particularly, you know, theatre and Shakespeare can offer to people who are incarcerated. Sure, thank you, Rowan. So what we know from our work is that people really value any opportunity to be involved in any kind of arts or creative activity in prison. And it helps to really break up the tedium of prison life. It helps people to look forward. It opens up opportunities. And it's one of the things it does as well is really build links with communities. So when I went to the, the performance that Rowan just mentioned, there were lots of other people from the community there in the audience. And we all managed, we were all able to speak with the cast members Members, and it helps people to, to build links that people took forward after, after the event. And we, we find that um, the arts really support mental health and well-being, which is really fundamentally important in prisons, which are such uh, distressing places to be a lot, of, a lot of the time. And particularly in the last sort of 15 months, we've been through a very difficult lockdown and people in prison have been been suffering from quite extreme restrictions in many in many cases so anything that can really help to support them is really really important it gives people ideas it gives people inspiration it helps to make them feel that they're taking taking them out of their, their austere environment it gives people hope and in prisons particularly when people are serving really long sentences or life sentences people are not going to get through those sentences without having well, having hope and it really helps people to fulfill their potential and to feel like they're part of a community and I think it's just fundamentally important this kind of work that we're in and many other people do in prisons is something that we should really be supporting a lot more than we do at the moment. Thanks Francesca. Thank um, and I mean, I know what a difference the Prisons Education Trust makes to so many people inside. Um, I, I'm very fortunate that some of my uh, actors, I call them my actors, that's really possessive, I don't mean it like that. Some of the actors that I work with uh, behind the walls um, benefit from the Prisons Education Trust support and, you know, are so are getting so much from the, the work that they're doing, you know, open university degrees, etc. cetera, um, that I know, you know, great prison governors like Ralph support uh, people doing that work. Um, but without the Prison Education Trust, that wouldn't be possible. But I think you're right, you know, community is so important and, and things like theatre bring communities together, whether that's the cast, whether that's people coming to watch a performance, it, it, it engages a whole group of people that otherwise might be quite disparate. So completely agree. Um, Sue, I'm going to come to you now, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and speak a little bit, about, I hadn't actually, I wasn't going to question you about your Romeo and Juliet project, although I'm sure you'll, there'll be opportunity for you to talk about that in a, in a moment. But I just wanted to talk, obviously your work is, is truly international. Um, and I know uh, you've probably been more restricted geographically by the last 15 months than most of us, because normally you would be, you know, here, there and everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you usually communicate with Sue discover she's in some far flung place. Um, but you've spent many years creating and, and championing the, the concepts of neurodramatic play. Um, mm. And obviously that's one of the things that you're, you know, clearly very well known for. And yet much of you work in the field in this field is underpinned by Shakespeare and the themes and the stories of Shakespeare. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it is that you find about Shakespeare that, that sort of encourages this neurodramatic play and encourages people of all ages to play because it's a, something that we often lose, isn't it, as adults? Okay, yes. I mean, the, to, for me, those two fields are intertwined. You can't, you can't separate them because uh, neurodramatic play reflects the current research and interest in neuroscience where a lot more is now understood about the brain and in particular, that area of the brain known as the storytelling brain, that there actually is an area that's been identified. And I would acknowledge the groundbreaking work that Kelly Hunt has done in this area too. I think she's a speaker later on. She, she spoke yesterday. Yes, she joined right. us yesterday. People will know her work, but her book, Shakespeare's Heartbeat, is absolutely revolutionary. So let, let's think about how we now can make links between the brain processes that we know from neuroscience and what goes on in Shakespeare, that we are tapping into a neurological base for understanding performance and storytelling. And what is theatre but stories in action anyway? So those two are intertwined. And I think for me, using Shakespeare I don't like that phrase, using Shakespeare, working with Shakespeare, playing with Shakespeare, is being able to tap into the bigger story where everybody can find their own smaller story. It gives safety, it gives borders for that to happen. So unlike sessions, for example, that might purely explore an individual's own family, through role play, maybe through psychodrama. We're expansionist when we go into using Shakespeare rather than reductionist through interpretations. And I like the fact that we can expand a person's view of the world, view of themselves, understanding of themselves and the world through the safety of doing a play. And that's what for me, Shakespeare's plays do, they are, have this universality of theme, but they create it in a very safe way for, for participation. Um, yeah, anything more you want me to say on that or is that okay? Well, personally, I would love to hear you talk all day, but then you know that I, I'm a huge advocate of the work that you do. <laughs> so, but no, I think that, that gives a brilliant answer. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Chris has just put in the chat that well, what is theatre but stories in action. Yeah, I think I'm afraid that will be getting tweeted later, Sue, mm. because I think that's a perfect mm. example of what theatre does. Um, um, so what, 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 just to quote you again, because I quoted you on virtually every page. Okay, just one little thing to add on to that. Um, Rowan, is that I think, I mean, what I'm hoping to do when I get a chance um, to go to the more to the Shakespeare Institute is to look at this whole area of staff education. I mean, just to give one example mm -hmm. from one um, forensic unit where I was working and I was about to start work on Midsummer Night's Dream and one of the staff said, oh, Sue, why Shakespeare? Why can't we do cold it? And yet at the end of the Midsummer Night's Dream project, he was the one that came to me and said, actually, Sue, I've learned so more about myself. I'm actually going to go home because I'm from abroad to sort things out with my family. But he had to make that commitment initially. He actually wanted to do cold it. So somewhere in there, there's something not just working with people in institutions, but the staff running them. 
Absolutely. And and I think, you know, there's so much learning that can be shared in all directions, isn't there? Um, and I will be honest, I, I often find certainly working inside that I I probably learn as much or more from the actors as they learn from me. Um, but but absolutely. absolutely, you know, getting getting staff on side and, and making sure that people do see the benefits is hugely important. And I think that links perfectly to, to talking to you, Ralph. Um, as I will be honest and say, I never expected to get a phone call out of the blue at the end of 2018, I think it was, to say, Rowan, I think you need to come into H&P Stafford. <laughs> okay, what have I done? Um, so obviously, <laughs> just for the record, Ralph did actually phone and invite me in to set up a theatre company there, um, for which I'm grateful every Sunday morning when my alarm goes off at 4.30 a.m. Thank you, Ralph. Um, but what what benefits did you hope that setting up a theatre company and, and a permanent collaborative theatre company using Shakespeare would bring to Stafford? And, and how did that play out in reality from, from your perspective as the governor of the prison? Yeah, so I guess just to give a bit of context about Stafford. Stafford's a, um, an old Georgian prison, not even Victorian, um, which was home to 750 men all convicted of sexual offences so a very specific kind of environment even within even within the prison system and one of my one of the things I was trying to achieve at Stafford was developing what we call a sort of a rehabilitative culture so creating a space where the men in our care had the opportunity to explore different identities to genuinely um I guess look to grow and grow away perhaps from some of the harmful behaviors that they that they had in the past and look to the future in terms of um what they were able to look for for the rest of their lives rather than looking back on what they've experienced previously and within that sort of environment you get a lot of issues around um labeling we know the stigma that will be attached to men who've convicted who committed those sort of offenses we also know um the a huge level of shame um, amongst those men and a huge loss of identity um, and a loss of, I guess, self-esteem and self-worth. So I don't need to tell everybody on the call that the, the benefits that theatre can bring to those sort of issues. I think one of the things that appeals around Shakespeare is, and, and Sue mentioned it earlier, but that universality of theme. Um, and what was fascinating for me was watching Rowan work with the men and watch them adapt Shakespeare to their experiences and to, to their lives and to the things that um, were important to them and explore some of those themes from their very, from their perspective. Um, I, I think the breaking down barriers bit was absolutely critical. So I, I very much wanted to bring the community into Stafford. Um, prisons and particularly sexual offenders is an area with a huge amount of, um, attention often and and i would probably include myself in this having not worked in the in that area before often poorly informed for lots of different reasons and, and highly stigmatized mm -hmm. and actually so to bring someone like rowan in to give the men the chance to work with somebody from from the community but then what was really powerful as well was break down some of those barriers with the staff in the prison so culture in a prison depends not just on the men not just on the leadership, but it depends on the staff at the ground floor. Hmm. And so for them to see the men interacting and engaging in a different way, in a thoughtful, creative, passionate way with, with Shakespeare, um, certainly broke down a lot of barriers. And, and to see staff performing alongside prisoners um, was, was incredibly powerful. And, and certainly the men that engaged in that as part of what was a much wider programme of creative arts at Stafford under the banner of Talent Unlocked, which, which we've carried on in multiple prisons now, but, but was just really created that sense of normalisation, created a sense of, you know, you're not just a sex offender, you can be an actor, you can be a performer, you can be a writer, you can be all of those things as well, um, and reaffirmed and sort of created positive identities for the men, which was which is massive for them. And if we're going to return them to the community as as productive citizens, and we had a program at Stafford called Active Citizenship, we need them to be able to explore the issues that got them where they are, but also to create 
a, po a more positive future for where they were going. And 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 Rowan and the work that Rowan did with the with the men just and you know this Rowan from your experience at Gartry and then at Stafford just did all of that and and then some to be honest. So it became a really core part of what we were all about because there's no one size fits all for you know rehabilitation in the prison is a controversial concept anyway and I have my own views on it. But one thing I do know is there's no one size fits all. And so with something like um, Emergency Shakespeare, it gave prisoners who wanted to express themselves through that medium a chance to do that. And it wasn't going to be for everybody, but it benefited yeah. everybody because it made such a difference to the culture of the prison. Yeah. So that's, I guess, my summary of what I saw at Stafford and, um, and what I know you saw at Gartry and, and what I know you'll see moving forward as we work together again, because we will be, so... <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely, Ralph. And uh, at the risk of, of, of adding my, my own thoughts for a sec, well, not my thoughts, one of the actors in, um, in Stafford, um, who incidentally is the incredibly talented person who drew our logo for SBBA. Um, and he wrote in his journal about that actually Shakespeare had given him a way to use the palette of emotions that had previously been so damaging. And I think that really sort of for me epitomized what Shakespeare can do and the difference it can make for a, an, a, a veteran who'd never I don't believe had any intention of getting involved in theatre previously but actually to be able to use that palette of emotions positively I think is is incredibly uh, important um, so thank you thank you all um, so I've just got a, a couple of sort of more general questions that I'd, I'd like to share and, and obviously people jump in you know with with your thoughts as, as you you wish to um, so for me, I think it's really important and it's a, a, sort of a bit of a double edged sword and a bit of a, a bone of contention that it, obviously Shakespeare can be a source of great creativity across social, educational and class divides. But it also involves this inherent risk um, of the, the kind of, you know, Shakespearean charity where it's, it's kind of shown as this, you know, gift that we give to people that they can aspire to be, you know, some middle class white person if they use Shakespeare, which, you know, I just find abhorrent. Um, and I just wonder what your opinion from your own experiences are around how we tackle that, what the relevance of it is, and, and actually, you know, how do we avoid falling into that trap? Because it is a, a constant battle for any of us who are using um, applied theatre, I think, in any, any way, shape or form. Yes, I mean, I'll come in here straight away, Rowan, because I come across this as well. People saying things, well, people don't talk like that anymore, as if they ever did talk in, in Shakespeare. <laughs> and really, we're back to an education exercise, and I think we're back to an education exercise in schools as well. I mean, I've done Shakespeare with five-year-olds, and they've got so much from it. And the schools have suddenly gone, wow, actually, yes, there is an understanding, even for, for young children, of images and metaphors and resolutions, um, love and revenge and all the themes we've been talking about between us. So I do think that it starts at the education level, right across the board, and perhaps be able to persuade uh, people who design curricula. Mm -hmm to rethink that perhaps every school should commit themselves to having Shakespeare in some shape or form. Yeah, no, uh, and, and hopefully taught in a really positive way as well, because I think I'm still traumatized from the woman who read me Othello in monotone mm. when I was at school. Um, it took me a lot of years to get beyond it. Um, Emergency Shakespeare will be performing Othello mm. shortly, or oh, in due course. But it did take me a while to get past the, the Othello in monotone. It was it was traumatic. <laughs> well, coming back to this idea that people think somehow Shakespeare should be read out in class rather than performed and understood and explored and turned upside down, etc. I mean, can I just leap in with a, a tangent, Rowan? Sorry, Ralph, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think just very quickly, um, just because it directly relates to that point. Um, I think what we what I've seen at, at, at Stafford with um, emergency Shakespeare and, and and I guess to an extent more broadly around theatre, um, but linking it directly to Shakespeare is that 
I talked about there isn't a one size fits all. All, all the all the men that engaged with this were very different from different backgrounds, from different different contexts, different offending. You know, there is no homogenous group within a prison and within the criminal justice system. They are identified by their offence, but even then, there are drastically different offences and different backgrounds, different reasons that have led them to be where they are. Um, and so I, I think there's something there about clearly from what I've seen, this can resonate across social divides, across socioeconomic divides, across um, culture, background, ethnicity. You know, th there isn't, there is nothing there that for me stigmatizes. you know, Shakespeare almost removes the stigma. And actually we can focus on that, I think, because it, there, is, there is that sense of inclusivity actually that comes with it. Um, and that removes it for me from, and should remove it from that sort of allegation of, well, this is all very middle class. It, genuinely, the people engaging with this are not middle class. They are societies, you know, they are the people that have, to some extent, been ostracized from society with good reason in many instances. But um, they still find that that common ground within, within Shakespeare and within theatre. So I, I think there's nothing more levelling almost than, than Shakespeare and theatre when it comes to that. So that's all I wanted to add. And, and, and if I can jump in there tangentially, and I'm going to commit a bit of a plug-in crime here by putting two things in the, uh, in the chat, one of which is a YouTube clip, uh, well, it's half an hour show from our, our winter piece and our future piece, because I've said earlier that we theme our work, and Laurie will know well, but our theme for the for this season is being human, you know, what it means to be fully human, what it means to be accepted by society as being human. So we did an updated version of Pinocchio, which turned into Pinocchio, um, which was about an elderly man living with a care assist robot and the robot somehow reminding him of what value there is in being human. So the, the robot never became human and married him or some weird thing and we're doing uh we're doing frankenstein um crikey next month which is terrifying um and ralph talking about the people that you work with rowan um has reminded me that you know our our theme of what it means to be human we began that theme in the year where black lives matter just exploded and we were reflecting back on well what's it been like for a, a chunk of society to feel for a long time that they are not treated as fully human. And that might mean because of your color, because of your gender, because of your physical or learning disability. But Ralph talking about those guys that you work with, of course, you know, um, male sex offenders, we refer to them as monsters, all the time. We refer to what they do as inhuman, but they're not monsters and they are human. And we need to grapple with that. And, you know, telling stories on stage might, feel like a very indirect way of grappling with that but in the rehearsal period in the kind of build-up to a show we are thinking about you know what is it like to be cast aside by by society and and told that you are less than human um so yeah you know it, it just felt like suddenly the people you're talking about are the people that you know they are today's frankensteins they are the people who are monstrous but you know no monstrous act comes out of nowhere i don't think and, i'm not and, and i have to just say as well um and and I, I i do go on about this so anybody who knows me knows i say this regularly there i don't know any bad people i know some people who have done bad things mm -hmm. and the vast majority of people who have committed crime and are serving time behind bars know that they have done something bad and they struggle to identify as somebody who is not a bad person. And the stigma that society heaps on that adds to that problem. And it's only when you see behind that stigma and you see behind those labels that you realize that they are people who have done a bad thing, but that could and often applies to many other people as well. And I think that's so important because it's so easy to other people to, to say that, yes, you are less than human. And I think, that is so damaging, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about physical ability, whether we're talking about um, being involved in the criminal justice system, et cetera. And it is so important that we get beyond that other in. And for me, that's where Shakespeare offers this opportunity. For some people, it's the medium in which they can find a way to move beyond the, the labels. 
and why ever those labels are attached. Um, but I'm really conscious of time and apologies because I could continue this panel all day, but I think that Matt, um, who is our, our technical guru, will tell me off if I just carry on and we just stay on until four o'clock. Um, but I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of you for being part of this panel and also to the, the many, many people who've joined and some great conversations going on in the chat. Um, so a, a big personal thank you for me. Um, it's wonderful to get to spend uh, 40 minutes talking to five of my favourite people. So thank you ever so much. And I hope that everybody who was involved enjoyed it as well. Um, and there'll be more conversations to be had. All right. Thank you.